Sometimes we think we surrender things when we haven't. And they're still laying here in our heart. They're still laying here even in, in our spirit sometimes. And God, God was showing me just in the past, I don't know, two, three days. He's like, you know, um, he made sense of certain areas that I had surrendered to him. And he, he made confirmation for me that I made a good choice and a good decision in areas. And I really believe that's the time that we're at right now. Um, I was reading the story of the road to Emmaus. If anybody has read that, you probably know the story. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look it up here because the Lord actually gave me the verse right as we were in worship this morning. And Luke 24, 13 through 35. So let me tell you the time that we're at. Jesus had just been crucified. It is the third day. That's why I thought it was so funny. The Lord's been waking me up at 3 o'clock every day to pray. And they're on the road to, it's called the, on the road to Emmaus. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus. About seven miles from uh, Jerusalem. That number seven has been a part of our ministry since we got here. God is bringing things to a completion this season because he wants to give us something new. That's what the cars represented this morning. That's what, because he's trying to give us something new. He's trying to bring to completion other areas of our life. And so as I was reading this, it was seven miles to Jerusalem. There is a completion that God was bringing forth of his crucifixion when he went to be crucified. And, he, and here we are on the road to Emmaus, and it's seven miles to Jerusalem. God doesn't make mistakes. When he talks about distances and miles and numbers, everything is very precise in the kingdom of God. There's no flaws in it. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. I really believe some people right now have felt they've been walking by themselves and they've been alone in the process of things because God has been taking us through a process that sometimes has been difficult. I'll tell you more why the process has been difficult in a minute. But as they go through this walk, but they were kept from recognizing him. Sometimes we think God isn't walking with us. Sometimes we think that he's not here with us. When we go through trials and storms, as, as the worship team was singing today, about this, we thank you even for the storms. Three o'clock this morning, the thunder came so hard, it woke me out of bed. And I knew it was the Lord because if, if you ask my husband, nothing wakes me up, unless the Lord does. I will stay there. I'll sleep through anything, any noise, anything. I'm just a heavy sleeper that way. <laughs> and this heavy thunder just came and showed up at 3 o'clock in the morning and shook me. And I woke up out of bed, and I was like, oh, my God, like, that's so you, Jesus. <laughs> like, okay, what, what do I need to pray for? What do you want me to do at 3 o'clock in the morning? And I'm telling you, we think that he's not here. He's not with us. We're alone in certain things. But this story right here should give you encouragement that he's right here with us, that he's with us in the storms. He's with us in the difficult times we have in our lives. So he, it says, and then if we go on, let's go to verse 17. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still and their faces downcast. Sometimes we get in a downcast, right, because of things we're going through. They had just seen the Lord be crucified. If you had seen the Lord be crucified, you would be sad too. If you went to go see the movie they created of the Lord being crucified, I don't know about you, but I walked out of there weeping and crying and so distraught by what the Lord, I mean, that wasn't even all of it. That was the closest they could come to what it looked like when they crucified him and the beatings. And so, <clears throat> so 
they're having this walk, and it's like us. Sometimes we have talks with one another, even in our congregation sometimes, and we're talking about situations that have occurred and happened. This is what these guys were doing. They were just having a simple walk, talking about what had just happened to Jesus. And they were being real people. They're like, can you believe this just happened? And this is what they began to say. They stood there with their faces downcast. Let's go to verse 18. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem? Who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet. He was powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priest and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. This is them in their mindset. This is them thinking in their own minds that Israel wasn't redeemed. <laughs> this is their, their, their flesh talking. And sometimes we can become like that ourselves. And then it says, you go on on 21, but we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that, that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they had not seen Jesus. He said to them, how foolish are you and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them that what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself, all they approached the as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as, as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us. For it is nearly evening, the day is almost over, so he went in to stay with them. This is a part that just like got my heart this morning. Verse 30. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. As soon as that happened, then their eyes were open, and they recognized him. And he disappeared from their sight, and they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned once to Jerusalem, and that's when they joined the other disciples. I don't want to have a moment of a road to Emmaus this season thinking God is not with us when he's right here in our midst. He is standing here, right here, walking with us. He is willing to talk with us. He is willing to have a relationship with us. And sometimes we think we're alone in situations, and the Lord is like, no, remember the story, the road to Emmaus. I was there. It was the third day. I was there, and I was chatting with them, and I was having a talk. The bread represented his body. We are his body now. It spoke volumes to me. And I'm sitting there and I'm reading it this morning and I'm like, God, you're so good that even in our midst of the storms, even in the midst of, of, of things happening that we don't understand sometimes, that you always bring confirmation of even our decision making. You always bring us clarity. What, their eyes begin to open with the breaking of the bread. Jesus is alive. He's resurrected from the dead. We, our eyes should be open now. I really believe the Lord is bringing increase to our vision right now. For the past two days, I was watching TV late at night, and my TV has this feature that I didn't know it had, and it has a 3D feature on it. Well, in order to see 3D, you have to have the glasses for it. 
And it was funny because my friends were here this morning and we were praying. And I, I got to pray with them before they left. And he said, it was crazy. I went into like this 3D image all of a sudden. And I began to see things. And I really believe this morning God's going to open our eyes to see him. Because I was trying to fix the TV and I was so frustrated. I was like, because I'm not the tech person. My husband and my kids are. And so I'm like trying to mess with it and trying to mess with it. And I told Pete last night, I was like, this thing is like looking so blurry. And I don't understand why. Is the TV broke or what? And he's like, no, you need special glasses to see the 3D. I got new glasses like a week or two ago. God speaks to us in the natural things that he's trying to speak in the spirit. And so uh, I, he says, yeah, you need special glasses to see the 3D. And the 3D has a better image of what we're looking at than the other, the other visions of your TV. And I was like, oh, I didn't know that. I didn't even know the feature was on my TV. And the Lord this morning was speaking to me about that. And he's like, I have more to show my kids. I have 3D things that I want to show my kids, but they can't see them because they're still wearing the old lenses. They're still wearing, they got a little religion in them still. They got a little, they got a little other things that they can't see and put on some new lenses on their eyes to begin to see the more that I have for them to see. And sometimes we got to get rid of the old way we see things, the old way we look at things, even things we were taught growing up and the process of that. And God's like, you just need to get some new lenses on your face so you can see the 3D clearly. And I don't know about you, but the 3D image shows you everything all the way around something. It's not just one side or the other side. You can see the whole entire thing. And I really believe the Lord wants to give us that today. He wants us to be able to watch and see things in the 3D aspect of heaven, of what heaven is trying to show us this season and not be okay with just seeing the old way. We could get an old TV. I mean, my parents, they were never about upgrading their TVs. They had old TVs. But I guarantee if you put the old TV and the new TV together, you're gonna notice the difference. You're going to notice the colors better. You're going to notice, um, and, and <laughs> I'm a person, like I'm a simple person, so I don't care about those things. I don't even know why the Lord has me sharing this, but this is the Lord telling me this. But I don't care about those things, but my husband does because he likes to watch football and he likes to watch all these, you know, act, action movies. And he says, you get a better view of the movie and it, it seems more real when you have a 3D view of it. And so I don't know about, like, if you have kids and you've gone to see a 3D movie and you put those glasses on that they give you to see 3D, it feels like you're actually in the cartoon or in the movie when you put them on. And you become a part of what's going on on the screen. See, God's speaking in the spirit. He wants you to become a part of what he's doing this season with each and every one of us. He wants you to come and partake and be a part of something real, something living, something breathing, and not just something you do on Sunday mornings. But it's something real and something vivid he's trying to show you with an increase of vision. But if, you're, but if you still have the old lenses on, you're not going to be able to see the 3D, the new thing he has for you. You're going to continue to see it blurry. You know that that's the one thing my husband has been struggling with even yesterday when we were here. His eyesight was just so blurry. But see, God's speaking in the spirit through the things that are happening in the natural. So I don't see it as a done deal. I don't see it as, oh, you know, enemy, you've won. No, I see it as, God, you're doing something new. I wanted to call today's message as surrender all because... The Lord has been telling me about submitting and submitting unto his will and really understanding what it is when you surrender things to him. In James 4, 7, it says, submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. The resisting has to come in the mindset. 
the resisting has to come in the way we're processing things through our mind, through our sight, through our vision, the way we're processing things even in our fleshly aspect. The devil will flee as soon as we resist him. So we have to begin to resist him in areas that he's come to mess with you in. You know, we were seeing as, as I'm no longer a, a child of, of, of fear. You know, I don't no longer have fear. I'm a child of God. How does that even happen? It happens by you knowing that if you resist the thought of the fear, because fear is in your mind, if you, if you allow it to be there. But God says, resist the devil and he'll flee. Resist fear, it'll flee. Resist sickness, it'll flee. Because the, the Lord doesn't make us sick. The devil does. Those are the attacks. So if you resist it and not agree with it, guess what? It has to go. It has to be gone out of your life. Even the things you struggle and have a hard time with, resist it and it'll flee. Because the Lord didn't send it to you. Romans 12, 2, do not conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Some of us have been tested a little bit. Some of us have been going through things and God's like, are you going to, are you going to, are you going to agree with my will? Are you going to agree with what you're seeing and hearing? That is not of my Holy Spirit. Mark 14, 35 and 36. And going a little further, he fell on the ground and he prayed. This is, this, we're talking about Jesus here. That if it was possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will but what you will. He goes and he throws himself on the ground talking to God, his father. And I think some of us have come to that place of just coming and saying, God, I, I just, I just, we have to get to that place of surrendering it back to the Lord. That to me was a sign of Jesus coming and surrendering it back to God. He knew what he was carrying of having to go be crucified was too heavy for him. So that was the point of he came in prayer and laid himself before God and said, God, if this cup shall pass, then let it pass. But your will be done through the process, not mine. John 15, 1 through 7, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that he may bear more fruit. Already you're clean because the word I have spoken to you. So abide in me and I in you, unless it abides in the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he, uh, he it, is, it is that bears fruit much fruit for apart from me you can do nothing we're going through a pruning process we really are you know we're going through the process because we have to come to God and know that he he has our story already written for us that he knows all things he sees all things and that's what he's been telling me every time something else would happen I see it. Don't worry about it. I see this happen. Don't worry about it. Oh, I, I already saw that. Don't worry about it. But we have to get to a place of humility to surrender it to him. James 4.10 says, humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Who exalts us? The Lord. We don't exalt ourselves. We don't have to go around telling people about our gifts and, and the great things that we've done because <laughs> he exalts us. We don't exalt ourselves. And sometimes the body of Christ has missed that. That one little sentence, they've missed it because they want to begin to exalt themselves through Facebook and all these different avenues. And God's like, I exalt you. When do I exalt you? When you humble yourself. When you make it about me and not you anymore. 1 Peter 5, 6 through 10, humble yourselves, therefore, 
under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. Casting, and then get this, because you come into humility, and, you, and, and you're under the hand of God because of humility, then at the proper time he'll exalt you, and then he goes on to say, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. This is where prayer comes in. You're being mindful. You're being watchful. Why do, we, why do we pray? Why do we intercede? Why do we have to be watchful? Because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Here's that word again, but resist him. Resist him firm in faith, knowing that the same kinds of sufferings are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. It's not just you going through this process. You're not the only one going through the pruning. We're going through it as a body. And then after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who gives us grace? The God of all grace, <laughs> who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. I think that's so powerful what he's saying there. It's him that's going to come do it all for us. And we're not alone. All of us are going through the process, maybe in different situations, but it all looks the same how the Lord sees it. All the attacks, all this, the process we're going through of the pruning, it all looks the same unto the Lord. But he's going to come in, and as long as we humble ourselves, he'll come and do the rest. Dying to self, that is a huge thing that we have to learn how to do. It's hard to die to yourself. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You know, I learned a long time ago that my, my life wasn't mine anymore. It was his. And if it's his, I can't make decisions for myself anymore because I feel like it or my emotions are turned and changed at times where my decision making gets changed because of my emotions. I cling on to Holy Spirit and I ask Holy Spirit for the strength to continue to be on the path that Holy Spirit told me to be on so I don't change my mind and I don't get into chaos with my mind being changed by the enemy all the time. But I rely on the prophetic word. I rely on those things that the Spirit of God has already spoken that I cannot move and I cannot change my mind unless he says. Amen. You have to be on that rock. Luke 9, 23, and he said to all, if anyone should come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Sometimes we get a little weary carrying our cross. Sometimes we get tired. But those are the times we cry out to him in humility and say, God, I can't do this by myself. But you're walking with me like you walked with the men in the road to Emmaus. We're not by ourselves. Mark 8, 35, for whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will come in and save it. I know it never makes sense, right? <laughs> you lose your life to gain your life. That's how the kingdom of God works. We try, we try. That's why I never agree with what the enemy is speaking or saying or doing at the time. I have to speak different. If I'm sick, I got to speak healing. If I'm, going, if I'm sad or, or depressed, I got to speak joy over myself. If I'm struggling in my finances, I got to speak prosperity over the finances. Because I don't live of what I'm seeing here. I'm living from an aspect of heaven. And I got to put on my 3D glasses on so I can see the fullness of what God wants to do. In the step process, it may not make sense. A lot of the things this past season for me didn't make sense. 
But the Lord is coming right now and he's confirming things. You see, this is why you did this. See, this is why you had to do that. And then it brings you comfort in your heart. Man, I didn't miss it. The Lord was with me like he was with the men to the road to Emmaus. And he led me and he showed me where to go and how to get there. And by faith, I moved in it. John 12, 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it bears much fruit. The obedience that God is having us have right now to not be shooken, to not be uh, changed in any way by our emotions or the situations we're going through, the Lord is doing amazing things to bring in the increase of the fruit. If, if we just stay persistent and we just keep plowing forward. I was watching this movie last night and they, and they kept saying, we got to move forward. We got to move forward. And they're like going through like these swamp lands and all this. And the guy just keeps telling his team, we got to just keep moving forward. And I'm going to tell you, we got to just keep moving forward. God has great things for us. And we just have to keep moving forward. And we can't look back anymore. The, uh, I was watching this, um, this. I was up late one night. And the Lord, um, I went to the kitchen to get some milk. And the milk spilt on me. And I was like, God, what, what, how did this even happen? <laughs> like, it just spilled all over the counter. And I, I did a message like, God, I don't know, maybe a year ago about not crying over spilt milk. You know that saying, don't cry over spilt milk? You know that they would literally go and suck up the milk from the table because milk was so precious in those days. It, it's like 1659, like back way long ago when that saying came out because I went and I read up on it and they would literally sup up the milk from the table because milk was so precious at that time it was so valuable to them that they didn't want to waste any of it but what they meant when they said that don't cry over spilt milk was that if some things have happened bad this past season some things that maybe you didn't understand some things that didn't seem like man lord what happened? Like, I, it doesn't make sense to me. The Lord says, don't cry over the spilt milk. He says, I'm the boss. I do, I, I'm the decision maker over everything. Don't cry over the spilt milk. I got better things for you because I'm the boss of all things. So what we thought we've lost or what we thought that we didn't have anymore or what, we, what, what changes we went through this past season, that's a lie of the enemy. We're not going to cry over spilt milk. He's the boss. He's the one that sees and hears everything we're dealing with. And the Lord has our back. The whole kingdom of heaven has our back. That's why our perspective with our new lenses of 3D, we have to begin to wear them, not wear the old lenses anymore. The old lenses will keep you depressed and sad and down and looking at the world a certain way. And the Lord's like, no, you're not even seeing it through my perspective. You're not seeing it through my lenses. I have something better for you. I have the new car. I have the new ministry. And it's not going to look like anything you thought it was going to look like. I'm telling you right now, it doesn't look like anything that you thought it was going to look like. It hasn't for me. It hasn't for me. Not one bit what I thought it would look like. But I'm glad. You have to be glad that it doesn't look like how you thought it would look like. You have to come to a place and be okay with that. Because God has us each on a journey. And our journeys are special. And that's one thing my pastor told me years ago. He says, you're not even allowing yourself to enjoy the journey because you're so concerned of the would have, could have, should have. That you are robbed from the joy of just being in that place of having his favor in your life. And so the good moments, the good times, even with your families, that God has allowed you to partake of. Even this past Thanksgiving, you were sitting with your family. You know, and we have to begin to value things again. And I'm sitting there this past Thanksgiving, and we haven't had a Thanksgiving like where it's just us four, me, my husband, and my two kids, 
in years. I can't even remember the last time we did that. And this past Thanksgiving, it was just us four. And the Lord told me that morning I was cooking. The Lord said, look around you. He says, I'm telling you right now. He says, to value your family, value what's in front of you. He said, because people will come and go out of your life, but they will always be there. So we have to begin to value our family again. If your family is not okay, pray for the restoration of your family. Pray for God to mend things, to make things right. Pray in intercession and prayer. God is taking us in a, into a season right now of intercession and prayer. And out of that intercession and prayer, we're seeing the effects of heaven touching earth through our prayers. And he's doing it very quickly. It's not like a, a time of where God's waiting. He's doing things very quickly and fast. And, and that's why we can't be like those two guys that didn't know that they were walking with Jesus. That they thought that they were just talking to just somebody that they were walking with. They were talking with Jesus. And they didn't even realize that he was walking with them. We have our moments like that. And I'm telling you, God is walking with us. We're on our road to Emmaus. He's redeeming things back for us. What did those guys say? I thought he was going to redeem Jerusalem. That was the one thing they said. I thought he was going to come and be the Messiah, redeem Jerusalem. Nobody said he didn't. But see, the enemy will come in and plant things in your head, thinking things that you think God didn't do. But God knows about it, and God did do it. And God is faithful in it. And so the, even the things that you thought God wasn't in, he was in it. He was right there walking with you on the road to Emmaus, and he was hearing all the talks between you and your husband, between you and your family, and he was right there in the midst of it all, seeing and hearing it all. And then he's like, they thought that I didn't come redeem Jerusalem. Let me sit them at the table and remind them of who they are. Because we're kings and priests that sit with the Father at the table. And as soon as that bread broke, which represented his body, he did not go through the crucifixion for nothing. He wasn't crucified for no reason. If you think you have problems and you think God is not big enough to come solve those problems, come solve those things in your family, come solve the, the thief and the destroyer that comes in constantly. If you think he's not big enough to do those things, I'm telling you he is because when he was crucified, there's the power. And as soon as that bread broke, which represented his body that broke, you know, some of us get to a state in our lives where we become broken before the Lord. And that's the best place to be. When we know we don't have it all together, I'll stand in front of you and say, I don't have it all together. There's things that God's working with me on. He's working through me. I'm the same. I'm the person walking with Jesus on the road to Emmaus. And I'm saying, Lord, I know you're here with us. I feel that you're here with us. I know there's good things coming. So I'm going to agree with heaven and not speak what I see in the natural, but I'm going to agree with heaven and speak heaven on earth that heaven will come and begin to touch people's lives, that there will be signs, wonders, and miracles by the, the mighty hand of God like we were reading about. What is the humility bringing? Dying to self. It brings in the mighty hand of God above our families and above this congregation and above things that he wants to do in the region and in the city. The mighty hand of God shows up, and it's powerful. If we just come in humility, know that we're not perfect. Come before him like the broken bread, so that way he can come in and show himself to us and not think we have it all together, because I promise you we don't. We don't have all the answers. We don't have everything perfect but it's the imperfection inside of each and every one of us that he comes and he breaks the bread and he allows us to see his face and to recognize that he's here with us. It's not when you have everything going well. 
It's not when your bank is full. It's not when your family's 100% all in unity. That's not when he, when the Lord comes and shows his face. He, the Lord comes and shows his face. When you become broken within yourself in humility and you're crying out in desperation for him, that's when his face shows up. And it's not the other way around. It's not like when everything's peachy and everything's going great. It's in those moments that the brokenness comes because you lay yourself at the Lord's feet and you say, God, I just come to worship you. I just come to love on you. I don't know what you're doing, God. It doesn't look like I thought it would look like. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't look okay. But God is a redeemer, and he's here to redeem. And the redemption comes very quickly. From one day to the next, when the people were brought out of Egypt, they got everything back in one day. Everything shifted and changed so I'm telling you this morning to encourage you. Can we just stand this morning? I'm telling you this morning that there's a shift and a change of favor. And from one day to the next where they lacked and they were slaves, as we were singing this morning, I'm no longer a slave to fear. As they were singing this morning about the slavery and the fear that came in. From one day to the next, God gave them everything. They left with more than they could ever imagine when they left Egypt. And where were they going? They were going to the promised land. We're going to the promised land in 2020. I'm telling you right now, I'm declaring it and I'm speaking it. There is promises that God has promised us and he is not a liar. He is faithful and he's going to bring the promises. And he didn't pick us up from Texas to move us here. So that way his promises can't come to pass because they will come to pass. But we just have to be in humility and say, God, here I am, God, whatever you want to do, God. I, I don't care if I look foolish. I don't care if I look silly, but I'm telling you, God. God's going to come in with such power and there's going to be such miracles and signs and wonders that are going to come into the state of Ohio and there's going to be such a fire of God that's going to begin to move in Ohio that Ohio is going to be full of fire in different cities and different places. Let me tell you, the connection with us and different pastors in the state of Ohio is not something we did. The connection comes because Holy Spirit connected it. Us being here today is something Jesus did. Jesus sent you here. It's not like I went to your house and knocked on your door and said, hey, you want to come join our congregation? You want to come be part of us? No, Jesus put something in your spirit that is burning inside of you that is needed for this season to do what he wants to do in this region and in this area. If you're an intercessor, begin to pray. If you're a worshiper, begin to worship. Whatever it is God has put in your belly to be and to do, then be and do it. Don't hold back anymore. Because I'm telling you, he wants to meet you there in that very thing he's called you to do and to be. He's like, I'm going to meet you there. On the road to Emmaus, I'm going to meet you there. And I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to hear what you have to say. And then I'm going to let you see me in that very thing that you haven't been able to see. Oh, you're a good God. Oh, you're a good God. <laughs> you're going to begin to show your face, God. And all the areas we thought we were defeated in God. All the areas we thought we were defeated in God. You're going to begin to show your face, God. All the areas we thought the enemy stole. You're going to be, <laughs> you're going to show your face in that, God. <laughs> Look, if there's something that you need this morning for God to show him his face in, begin to say it out of your mouth. Because there's authority in your tongue. There's authority in what you speak. And if you don't speak it out of your mouth and hold it here, then it can't get into the atmosphere of heaven where it's supposed to be. 
God takes your declarations. Heaven comes and meets earth. And the shift and the change begins to come in. Some of you need to go home and start praying in your houses. I don't even know who that's for. But you go in and you walk through the hallways of your house. And you take back the house. And then you take back all the things that the enemy thought he could have and steal. And you say, God, I take back my house. I take back my land. I take back the things that the enemy thought he could have. And that the enemy thought he could steal, God. God, I take it back. God, I take back my sleep, God. Who's having problems with sleeping at night? Because God's going to give you your sleep back. And he's going to give you your rest back. God, we speak it forth right now. Sleep and rest. (laughs) Peace is going to be in those, God, that have had a hard time sleeping, God, at night. (laughs) You've been sick. Say, God, I'm redeeming my my health back, Lord. God, I take back my health, God. If it's your family, you need redemption for. (laughs) The blood did it all. The blood redeems all. That's what the body, the bread represented when it broke. The blood that he shed redeems every single part that you need this morning. So begin to say it. God, I redeem back my family, God. God, I redeem back prosperity, God. (laughs) We won't lack, God. Oh, we thank you, God. (laughs) We thank you, God. (laughs) For each of us are on our road, uh, our own road to Emmaus, God. (laughs) And you're going to show your face to us, Lord. In every part, Lord, you're going to show your face, Lord. In every part, God, we come in humility before your throne this morning, God. We surrender everything to you, Lord. Begin to surrender things unto the Lord this morning. Lay them at his feet this morning. You're going to begin to feel a weight lift off of you when you surrender it to him. Whatever it is you've been carrying, give it back to the Lord this morning. I was like, man, I don't want this, Lord. I'm going to give it back. I'm going to give it back. I'm going to give it back to you, Lord. (laughs) Thank you, Jesus.